Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our service here today on this beautiful June Sabbath morning. Uh, a special welcome to any visitors we have with us, and of course to Reverend David Sutherland uh, once again as he, he joins with us here. The midweek will be 8 p.m. as usual. John Coulter has taken it this week, and the subject will be on health. Next Sabbath day, um, John Coulter will be taking the service here um, at, at midday as usual. The church committee will meet for the first time in over a year uh, next Monday evening at 8 p.m. In, in the main hall. Now, there's a couple of um, note things here from the uh, relief committee summer uh, team there's applications uh, can still be made to the, be part of the team working in Larne and uh, the Woodstock Road Church building so those um, can be emailed to um, I think here it's, it's Sandra Stewart uh, again, I leave this sheet on the table there, and if you want it, the email address, it's on it. The other thing that they have sent out is a leaflet. They're available there on the table on their appeal. Now, the financial, uh, the Go Relief Committee, they, they don't take any money from the central funds, and their income is entirely from donations. And all your donations to that would go to the, uh, the work that's outlined. Um, you may have seen the uh, work in uh, South Africa with Mary McCollum, the work in Moldova, I think it is, and the third one is uh, work in... Um, Ethiopia, where there's a tremendous amount of disturbance at, at the moment, and your support for that would be greatly appreciated. So those sheets, whatever aren't used today, we'll, we'll put them out in the sheets for next week. Okay, so with that, I'll hand over to David. Good morning, and thank you, Leslie, for your welcome here again, and it's, it's great to come down here uh, to Drumbog. I'm getting to know more of your names, and it's been great. John and I have been out visiting, uh, got to most of your homes. You might not have been in, but we've been at your door. Uh, really grateful that nobody's set the, the big dogs on us yet, uh, so we've been really enjoying uh, getting to know you here, uh, and trust we'll get to know you uh, better over the time uh, that we spend here in, in Drumbog. Everyone's really welcome to our worship today, and we trust that God will bless each of us, however old we are, however young we are, as we come and worship before him this morning. Today we start uh, our worship uh, praising God from the central chapter of the Bible, Psalm 117. Uh, we're singing uh, this short psalm together, just two verses, but really powerful verses. Our subject today, the mark of the church that we're thinking about today is evangelism, uh, sharing the good news of Jesus. And, and some of us find that difficult to do, and, and we'll be thinking about that in church today. But here is this global vision of all nations praising God, big nations, small nations, near nations, distant nations. What a vision this is. It's not just a prayer, it's a promise as well that God's grace will so work throughout the earth 
that people from all nations will praise God. And here we are in Ulster this morning, and we praise him. Psalm 117, let us praise God. Shall we join together in prayer? Uh, Let us come before God as we pray. Lord God of heaven, we bow down before you this morning. We come before you as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, directed by this psalm to bring our praise and worship unto you. You are the only God, the one true God, the one to be worshipped and honoured and exalted by us. You are the living God who receives our worship and who hears our prayers. And we draw near before you today, Lord, as men and women and children, to exalt your name, to engage in this highest activity that a human being can engage in, to praise you and worship you, the God who gives to all life and breath and all things, the God who has blessed us and provided for us, who has lifted us up and brought us down, the God who has sent your only begotten Son into this world out of love and mercy towards us, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. We worship you, O God, You who have made all things and have made us. You who sustain all things and who sustains us. We bring you praise that you have dealt with us in your grace. We worship you for this. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Lord, fill our hearts with gratitude and praise for for your mercies towards us on this day. And fill us with praise because your word is eternal and truth. Thanking you, Lord, that we can hear your word and sing your word and read your word today knowing that your word abides, that your word is dependable, that your word is true. And we pray that in our lives and experiences this morning, we will find great comfort and joy in that assurance. Forgive us, Lord God, we pray, for not worshipping you as we ought. Forgive us, Lord, for often engaging in prayer and worship in a distracted and half-hearted manner, of not realising your true majesty and glory and worth. Forgive us, Lord, for that. Forgive us for worshipping ourselves for placing the focus of our time and energies upon ourselves and our sustenance and advancement and not giving to you the glory that you deserve. And as we come today, feeling, Lord, our unworthiness, recognizing and acknowledging our sinfulness before you, O God, grant us that assurance of your mercy provided for us in Psalm 103, that as far As the east is from the west, so far have you removed our transgressions from us. Grant us that assurance and the ensuing joy that comes from that confidence that you have forgiven us through Christ as we draw near before you in his name. Amen. 
Our Old Testament reading today is from the book of Isaiah and chapter 55. Isaiah and chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55, and we want to read from this chapter uh, together. It's part of this global vision that Isaiah has in his incredible prophecy, based on that wonderful insights into the suffering servant of God given us in chapter 53. The fruit of his labors and his sufferings uh, will be the salvation of Christ sent out into the nations. Psalm 50, uh, Isaiah 55, uh, from the beginning. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good. And delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. And I will make you an everlasting covenant. My steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples. A leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know. And a nation that did not know you shall run to you. Because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out of my mouth, It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. That shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Showing you a globe today perhaps punishes you. You may be been thinking about your summer holidays and wondering where you can head off. Perhaps in years past you have gone to distant shores and thoroughly enjoyed that experience, but but now uh, we're rather restricted uh, in the green countries that we can head off to. But today we're, we're thinking about the world and the vastness of our world. How many people live in the world to the nearest billion boys and girls? Is it five, six? What number was that? Seven. This is great. Uh, Fantastic. Seven billion, of course. All those zeros uh, on the end. Just a bit over seven now. An incredible number, isn't it? But that that is the world that that we're thinking about. So, in which country then do most people live? Begins with a C. China. China. 
great stuff. Uh, that's my family at the back there, uh, by the way. So uh, <coughs> very good, Naomi. Uh, that's that's brilliant. China. That's, that's good. Maybe got some help there. Uh, so. Uh, what about this? Now, this is a really hard question and was debated in our kitchen this morning. In which country do the fewest people live? It's, it's a hard question. and You're allowed to disagree with this part in the sermon. Uh, but <coughs> begins with V. Okay. It's seemingly the Vatican City and that is in the city of... Someone say Rome? Okay, okay. So, uh, less than a thousand people uh, live there and by some sociologists it's described as, as a country. That, that was uh, quite, a, quite a hard one. One more question then. Which country has the largest area? Acres? The most acres? Which country is the biggest? Yes, Russia, that's fantastic, that's, that's great, and, and there's people here uh, that could probably talk to you a lot more about, about these countries, uh, and, and I feel I'm in the presence of some experts uh, around here, isn't that right Matthew? Uh, so, Russia's great, and even on this map, you can see how massive uh, Russia is. And isn't that amazing, boys and girls, that God wants everybody to hear about Jesus that's his desire and not just people in the big countries like Russia or the small countries or those who have the, the largest population like China he wants all 7 billion people to hear about Jesus Perhaps this afternoon, boys and girls, you could plague your dad or mom. I know they probably like a siesta, a little snooze on a Sunday afternoon to, to help them prepare uh, for the busy week ahead. But there's a, a fantastic website called Prayer Cast. And Prayer Cast has a three minute video on nearly every country in the world. Choose your favourite country this afternoon, boys and girls, and get your parents to show you the video. And then maybe spend a, a, a minute praying for that country. Let's, let's pray today. Lord in heaven, we thank you that we're able to think together in, in these moments about your world, its vastness, its wonder, its variety, its beauty. What a God you are. Not only concerned with those outward issues, but with the inward issues of our heart as well. And Lord, we, we come to you today uh, praying for the, the advance of your gospel. We think of the, the many places who have never heard, the many people who have never heard the gospel. And we pray that you will be with those organizations who plan to, to bring your word there and who are seeking to translate your word into the language of those people groups. And we pray that you will prosper them in their efforts. Help us, Lord, in our outreach and in our witnessing within our class at school within our community, within our family. Lord, help us to be good messengers of the gospel. Thank you for the health that we have today, that we can be here in church. Thank you for your word that's in our language and in our hands. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, which helps us to understand your word. Thank you for Jesus, the Savior. Thank you for the weather, Lord, that the farmers have really appreciated and been able to do so much work in. We worship you today for your goodness and mercy. And we pray for the nation's leaders as they meet in the south of England at this time. Leaders of powerful and influential nations. And we pray that they will make good policies and give good leadership at this time. 
We pray for our NHS and for the challenges that they are facing in these days and the uncertainty of the future challenges. We remember them. We pray for our politicians as they seek to give leadership and take decisions in these crucial times. We pray for guidance and wisdom for them. We pray for your church, Lord, and for the upbuilding of your church and the advance of your church. Lord, we pray for those in countries where there is great persecution and restriction that we, they cannot meet as we do here and we remember our brothers and sisters in those circumstances. And for our own denomination, we pray for the work in Spain, the work in Nantes, the work in Galway. We pray for more men for the Christian ministry. Lord, we come to you with our need and prayers in these days. We pray for Drumbog congregation. We pray for the elders as we meet this week that you will help us in our plans and discussions. We pray for the committee as, as they meet as well in a week's time. We pray that you will help them in, in their decisions and, and leadership. We pray for all the church members, Lord, that you will grant your grace and your blessing and your presence. We pray for the bereaved. We pray for those who are unwell. We pray for the lonely. We pray for young people sitting exams. We pray for the children. We pray for the elderly. We pray for this community and its need, Lord, and we pray that you will use this congregation within this community in friendship and in witness and in help. We pray for Richard Morrison as he comes to the, the congregation in, in Tamlach that you will bless and use your servant, that he will settle in well here and be a, a great influence within this community. We pray for John and Deborah as they work in, and serve in Ballylagan and Drumbog at this time, that this will be a really useful experience for them and that they will develop in their gifts and preparation for ministry. Father in heaven, we worship you today and we pray that as we come to hear your word, Lord, that you will prepare us and that your word will be effective in our lives, that we will receive it with meekness and that your spirit will apply it to our circumstances. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our New Testament reading is from the book of Acts and chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. We're reading verses 1 to 8 of this chapter, Acts and chapter 8. Reading verses 1 to 8 of this chapter. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. They were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men carried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits came out of many who were processed, crying with a loud voice, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. Evangelism. Synod this year emphasized evangelism the spread 
of the gospel. And it was refreshing uh, this year. Some of the elders uh, will agree, I'm sure, to dwell on this subject of evangelism. During Synod, we heard of a group of Reformed pastors in the south of Ireland who have come together to work together in the planting of new congregations within the south of Ireland. We heard of the call which Isaac Bericol has received from the Seville congregation and were shown a video of the building in Seville and the group of 40 who want Isaac to be their pastor. We heard from Joanne Wright in Convoy, a small congregation there, but one which is reaching out into their town and ministering to the, the woman of Convoy. We heard, as Leslie mentioned, also this morning of Mary McCollum uh, serving in a sports academy in George in South Africa. Her mentoring group seeks to direct the young girls of that vicinity into the ways of Jesus. And Lindsay Brown, who spoke to us on the Wednesday evening, described to us how God's operations have shifted from the northern hemisphere into the southern hemisphere. And while we may be discouraged in the northern hemisphere of the, the little progress within Europe in relation to the gospel, in the southern hemisphere, great strides are being made and Christ's church has been wonderfully extended. But when did it all start? Where did this global evangelization begin? We come to our chapter today in the book of Acts and chapter 8. I'm using the term evangelism in the sense of speaking the good news about Jesus to others. Evangel, in the phrase evangelism, comes from the Greek word for gospel, for good news. And so evangelism is sharing the good news with others. The book of Acts begins in Jerusalem, doesn't it? And it ends in the city of Rome, doesn't it? The book of Acts is tracing that advance, that progress, that scheme of evangelism by the early church through those regions from Jerusalem to the heart of the Roman Empire in Rome. And on Wednesday evening, Lindsay Brown, he <coughs> identified a, a particular trait of, of mission. One particular trait of mission which he spoke to us about was sometimes people are brought to us. He spoke about immigration in our time and how God has brought many people from other countries to our country. And he looked into the, the book of Acts and he argued that most of the people who became Christians in the book of Acts were people whom God had brought from other countries to the church. In this chapter we read about the Ethiopian eunuch and he had come from his country to Jerusalem. In chapter 2 perhaps you, you remember that long list of countries where People had come from to Jerusalem and they became Christians. Uh, and you think of the, the new houses being built in Inner's Rush or, or down in Tamlach. Uh, and God sometimes brings people to your community. But another side of mission is that, that, that we go out to them uh, with the message. Uh, and we'll be thinking of that today. So let's think first of all of the, the map of evangelism, the messengers secondly of evangelism, and then thirdly the matter of evangelism. Let's think first of all of the, the map of evangelism. 
And we're thinking today primarily of the fourth verse of chapter 8. The map of evangelism. The word used in verse 4, scattered, is a really important word. It's a kind of technical word within the Bible. It it means, as you would know, to, to be dispersed. And perhaps this week you'll be scattering grass seed in your fields. But within the Bible, this word is used of two major events. In the Old Testament, it was to do with the exile. The policy of the Assyrians and the Babylonians, as you know, was to transplant people from their own country into a foreign country. They were scattered. They were dispersed into another region. But then this word is also used of the New Testament church being scattered as we have it here. They were being dispersed. Here is a a rerunning of that Old Testament scattering of God's people into the nations. But the crucial difference is that in the Old Testament, it was God's judgment on his people. In this case, it is God sending out his people with the message of the gospel into the nations. To be witnesses and messengers and lights in a dark place. And here in this verse, we have the cause for this dispersion. It wasn't that the church had sat down and said, well, you know, there's all these nations around us who are given to idolatry, who who worship false gods. We need to go with the message of the gospel to them. That's not how it happened. It happened as a result of the persecution of the church by Saul of Tarsus. You remember Stephen, the the first martyr, had been stoned. He was a Greek-speaking Jew. He had a large following in Jerusalem and Saul's persecution was directed towards them. One writer estimates that there were around 25,000 Christians in Jerusalem at this time. So perhaps around 10 or 15,000 of them were people who left that city and who went into the nations. They fled from the ravaging, brutal persecution headed up by Saul of Tarsus. Chapter 11 and verse 19 tells us that they not only went into Judea and Samaria, as this chapter indicates, but they went as far as Antioch and Phoenicia and Cyprus, 300 miles away from Jerusalem. And this was God's purpose, wasn't it? This was his intention prophesied in the Old Testament, sung off in the songs of the Old Testament church, commissioned by Jesus, you remember, in the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. God used this persecution of the church. To fulfill his purpose and send his people into the world. Currently the media is dominated by the the G7. uh, Those leaders of powerful and influential countries. Canada and France and Germany and Italy and Japan and the United Kingdom and the USA and the European Union. They are gathering there, they are talking, they are deciding policy and and God is interested in their countries but also in all the nations of the earth that all will hear and receive the good news of Jesus. This is the map of evangelism. And isn't God's ways incredible? 
There was Saul and he was seeking to contain the situation. He was seeking to imprison the followers of Jesus and intimidate them and silence them. But such is the greatness of God that he uses the wicked schemes of Saul and his cronies to further his purpose. To send his church with the message of Jesus into the ends of the earth. And you and I, my friends, we're to have the same mindset that the Lord our God has. That the good news will will not be contained within these beautiful walls that surround us here, but will be taken out into the ends of the earth and into the community that surrounds us here. It was interesting that they went to the Samaritans, wasn't it? Because as we know, the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. There was a long history of warfare and rejection and and, and antagonism between these two parties. And yet, here were these people suffused with the message of God's grace towards them. That ancient animosities was no barrier to them. To take the gospel even to their enemies. The map of evangelism is to go into all the earth. Let's think secondly of the messengers of evangelism. The messengers of evangelism. Oh, that's easy, you say. That's easy. That is the preacher. That is what the preacher is there for. The preacher is there to proclaim the good news of Jesus, And that is one of our greatest joys and greatest privileges. And we have this in verse number five, that Philip, one of the deacons, not one of the disciples, one of the deacons, he proclaimed to them the, the message of the gospel. Proclaimed, it's a, a, a special word, it, it was used of a representative of a king who would go into a town and would stand in the middle of that town and would announce the royal message. Perhaps it was a holiday on Monday. Or perhaps it was a, more likely, a rise in taxes. But that was the herald's job. And he went with the authority. He might get pelted with rotten tomatoes or old cucumbers. But he delivered that message with authority. And that's the word that's used of preachers. That we come with God's authority. With this message of grace and salvation. And we do proclaim the saving grace of Christ. And so preachers are messengers of evangelism. But it's not only preachers. In verse number 4, we read this phrase. Those who were scattered went about preaching the word. And the word preaching there is not used in 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 an official sense. But it means sharing the word, telling the word, conveying the word. It's describing those who were fleeing from their homes in Jerusalem because of persecution. And as they came into villages and towns and cities, you can imagine it. People would come out and say, why is this crowd of refugees among us here? Where have you come from? Why have you come from? Why are you running? They told their story. And they witnessed through their story to every town and city from Jerusalem to Phoenicia to Cyprus to Antioch, hundreds of miles away. And you say, well, you know, I I could never preach. And and we're not all asked to preach. We're not all called to preach. But rural people are really good conversationalists. When I was moving to Ballylagan, and I haven't ascertained the authenticity of this yet. It was just someone, someone said to me that you'll find rural people nosier and friendlier. 
And I'm still trying to work out, is that actually true? But I have found that they're really good at speaking. And that's a great advantage that you have. That, that you can, in your conversation, as these persecuted people did, be able to witness for Jesus. So you've got a hospital appointment. And your neighbor asks you, when you come back, how did you get on there? And you can tell them and you can add in, it was amazing. God filled my heart with peace. Or perhaps you have a hundred odd calves and you've got to sell them down at the market. And you return home from your sale and your neighbors ask, and and how did it go? And, And you say to them, God was really good. Gave me a great price for those calves. Or perhaps you're on holidays this year down in Newcastle and County Down and, and you return back and your family asks you, well, well, what was the holiday like? And you can say in your report, what an amazing world God has made. Here are these people. They, they're running from Jerusalem. And as they come into these villages all the way from Jerusalem to Cyprus and Phoenicia and Antioch, hundreds of miles away, in a very natural way, rooted to their own experience, they're able to to bring in Christ through their circumstances. You don't need to make a sermon. You don't need to read deep theological tomes. Bring it into your everyday conversation with your neighbors and friends. The messengers of evangelism. And then lastly, the matter of evangelism. What is it that we're to to speak about? And we have this with the definite article in verse 4 and in verse 5. The word and then the Christ. The word in verse 4. This is a Uh, an abridged version of the the fuller terminology that we find in the book of Acts. It's a very shortened form, the word. Later on in the chapter, in in verse 14 and verse 24, we have this phrase again, and, and there it's described as the word of God, the word of the Lord. In chapter 13, it is described as the word of salvation. In chapter 14, it's described as the word of his grace. And when we pull all this together, we we understand what's been meant here. It's God's word about his saving grace in Jesus Christ. That we are not forgiven by our efforts. But that we are forgiven freely and fully by God's abundant grace through Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2 verse 8, by grace we have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And it was that word, you see the definite article here, the word, the supreme word, the authoritative word, the word from heaven, that is what they spoke As they went to those villages and towns and communities away from Jerusalem. But in verse 5, the parallel phrase, the phrase which elucidates that terminology more for us is the Christ. The very center of their message. At the very heart of that word is the Christ. Jesus, the Savior whom God has sent from Genesis 3 verse 15. The one promised. The two crushings in that verse. The crushing of the heel and the crushing of the head. Yes, the promised one would suffer. Satan will crush Jesus' heel. But Christ will conquer Satan. He will crush his head. And Through the Psalms. And the prophets into the New Testament, the Christ, the anointed one, the promised one, 
is described. That's the message that we have to convey to others. Spurgeon was very insistent that we don't get sidetracked and that we bring the message of Jesus to others. He described a a missionary group who went to a tribe who'd never heard the gospel or had a Bible and they thought, well, we need to start right at the beginning here. We need to talk about the creation of the world and we need to then talk about how God governs all things. And for years, they progressed with that message and eventually they got round to telling this tribe about Jesus. The tribe believed and asked them, why didn't you tell us this at the very start? This is our message to tell of Christ. It's easy to get sidetracked and blown off course. There's there's an abundance of views and ideas all around us. And and Philip here could have got blown off course. The next incident was the towns believed. The next incident is the apostles came down from Jerusalem. The next incident is Simon Magus wants to buy the Holy Spirit. There's all kinds of things going on in Philip's life. And yet we come later on in the chapter to, to his Situation with the eunuch. And in verse 35 we read. He told him. The good news. About Jesus. In verse 5. At the very start. He preaches the Christ. In verse 35. He, he's still on course. Still on message. Tells him. The good news. About Jesus. We need to get beyond our denomination, beyond our religion. And we need to get to the the core of the message to speak to our neighbours about Jesus. The map then, it's the whole world. Lindsay Brown told us that there's a billion people out of the, the seven billion that we thought of already, a billion who are classified as unreached, who do not have a single portion of the Bible in their own language. And he told us about a scheme in in America which adopt a people, which you take one of those 250,000 people groups and pray for them. And perhaps that's something that we might think of doing. But what about your own family? Your own neighbours? Your own classmates? What a thing it is for you to pray for them that they will come to Christ. And as you pray, just watch God working. Hudson Taylor, that great missionary to China, He in his lifetime desired to move people just by prayer. The messengers, can I encourage you to keep witnessing for Jesus? I was at a wedding two weeks ago down in Larchfield Estate outside Lisbon. Very, very nice place to be on on a sunny day. And I had to take the service so people knew I I was a a minister. And as I was walking in for tea, one of the groomsmen was walking alongside of me. And without any introduction, said to me, I did a Christianity Explored course seven times. (laughs) I began to look at this guy and go, is this guy, is, is, is he all right? You know, does he have some... Issues uh, that I had to do this course seven times. I, I later found out that he is a Rolls Royce engineer. And at his interview, the interviewers set him down an equation which they did not know the answer to. And in that interview, he worked it out and told them how to solve the problem. But he said to me, 
I did that Christianity Explored course seven times and still wasn't a Christian. He went to London to a church and he became a Christian there. Would I have done that seven times with him? Would you have done it? Let's persevere in telling our family, our children, our neighbours about Jesus. And the matter, maybe you struggle with witnessing to your farming associates, people in your office perhaps. One of the interesting things in our postmodern world, and, and this is to encourage us, is that if people respect you, they'll respect what you say. People aren't interested in truth these days. Postmodernism's all about there being no absolute truth. You can believe as you want, but what people are interested in our time is how do you live? And they'll study you, and when they've got the measure of you, then they'll listen to what you say. And I encourage you, as farmers, as businessmen and women, as people in your community, you live well, and people will listen to you when you speak about Jesus. Evangelism. Did you see the interview with Boris Johnson the other day and, and Preston from ITV, National T Television? Preston, the journalist from ITV, he was, he was on to, to Boris Johnson and, and saying, do you believe in God? Uh, Keir Starmer had come out saying that, that he was an atheist, the, the leader of the, the Labour Party. He, he was an atheist. And so Preston had latched onto this and was challenging the Prime Minister. What do you say? Do you believe in God? What would you have done? What would you have said? National television. Whatever you think of Boris Johnson, this is what he did. He quoted the Bible. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Our Prime Minister wasn't ashamed to do that. Let us, who know Christ and his grace, not be ashamed of him this week. We want to sing in closing today from Psalm number 22 Psalm 22 we're singing from verse 20 to the end it's on page 41 Psalm number 22 from verse 20 to the end a psalm which is divided up, isn't it, to the sob in the first half and the song in the second half. And there is a, a deep theological connection here, isn't there, between Jesus' sufferings in the first half of the psalm and then the spread of the gospel into the ends of the earth in the second half of the psalm. And we sing this second part. Psalm 22, verses 20 to the end. Let us praise God.
Shall we join together in prayer and let us pray? Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we've been together today with your word, Lord, with your people, with your Holy Spirit among us, opening up your word and looking back into the, the beginnings of the New Testament church. Thank you, Lord, for your incredible ways, for your sovereign purposes over all things. Even the, the hatred of the human heart cannot resist your will and your vision. Thank you for this global vision that you have, that your word will be brought to the ends of the earth. And we pray today that you will prosper missionary organizations and those involved in the translation of your word, that every people will hear the message of Christ and know the grace of God, we pray. We pray that you'll help us to be messengers in whatever role that you have appointed us and position in which you have placed us. Help us, Father, in our conversations to honour you and speak of you, we pray. And we thank you for the message that we have to convey, the message of Christ. Thank you for the hope. Thank you for the grace. Thank you for the power. Thank you for all that you've given us in your Son, Jesus Christ. And we pray that we will be enthralled with him and speak out of full hearts to others of his glory and his grace. Now may grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit rest on and abide with you all. Amen.